This may surprise many Europeans clicking on this, but the best-selling French car brand in the US for the last 30 years has been Bugatti. This is despite the fact that Bugatti usually makes somewhere around 100 cars a year. The big three of France, Citroën, Peugeot, Renault, all pulled out of the US by the early 90s. Today I'm going to tell you some of the reasons why this happened. First off, don't come in here with something like, well, actually, my uncle has a Renault Dauphine. Because tell me, how many times have you seen a French car just driving around out here? How many times have you seen one in the Walmart parking lot when you go to buy milk in the US? Seeing a French car over here is about as common as it is to see a North American esports team win a major tournament. Secondly, there's going to be some people come in here and try to argue that the reason these companies struggled in America is because the Americans are racist towards the French. If that little thought is wiggling through your brain wrinkles, you got to be on those Enid Oklahoma mind blowers. Do you really think that Americans in the mid 20th century had more animosity towards the French than they did towards the Germans and the Japanese whose cars have sold great hair? Read a book. Also, people often bring up unreliability as the reason they failed. And I think this is a cop out answer for one simple reason. The British were able to sell cars here. They sold hundreds of thousands of MGBs in the US and they didn't even come with a radiator large enough to keep them cool in most of the US. There are even now companies in the US that make parts for MGBs to make them actually work. On top of that, Land Rovers and Jaguars are both very common in the US despite the fact that historically, their mechanics were about as sorted out as Boris Johnson's hair. If you ever want an interesting look into human psychology, go to a Land Rover owner's forum. They sound like they're in an abusive relationship and trying to defend it. No, I promise it's completely normal to put a new water pump in a car every three years. Anyone who says otherwise is lying. The unreliability definitely didn't help the French, but I don't think it was the end all be all of their issues here. Now let's get right to how the French fumbled the US car market like they fumbled the Battle of Agincourt. <laughs> One of the biggest issues in selling cars in more than one place is that you have to accommodate more than one set of rules. This is a big part of why if you ever watched Top Gear back in the day, you would see cars that aren't sold here, even though the company operates here. There are a ton of differences between the EU and US regulations. Some things are more strict in the US, some things are more strict in the EU. For instance, the EU requirements require better headlights. But the US has better rollover standards because Ford and Firestone tried to kill everyone with explorers in the 90s. Also, as you can see in this very helpful study I found, Modern emissions regulations vary greatly between the two areas. The US is more strict on nitrogen oxides and non-methane organic gases, while the EU is tougher on carbon. Also, the EU makes its rules easier for diesel cars where the US does not. That's why diesel passenger cars have been pretty rare in the US for the past few decades, while they make up to 13% of cars sold in Europe each year. I bring this up because regulations killed Citroen in the US. See, in the 70s, Citroen made a name for themselves with their hydro pneumatic suspension. This was a system that used mineral oil reservoirs that are pressurized with nitrogen to perform actions such as leveling the car. What the US regulators took issue with is at the time, there were rules about how high off the ground your bumper had to be. This was an issue for the Citroen DS because it had adjustable ride height due to its mineral oil shenanigans. This in conjunction with overall poor sales caused Citroen to pull out of the US in 1974. The messed up part of this is the US changed the rule in 1981, which would have allowed this car. Citroen was also having a lot of financial issues in general at this time. In 1936, Citroen was bought by Michelin because they were going broke. Then in 1968, Michelin was starting to get tired of owning Citroen and sold 49% of it to Fiat. Weirdly, at the same time they did this, they also bought Maserati. Then in 1974, the same year they left America, the French government had Michelin give up Citroen so they could merge with Peugeot and try to keep them from tanking the French economy. They also sold off Maserati to De Tommaso, who somehow had money at that moment. And now, two years ago, Peugeot Citroen merged with Fiat Chrysler, which means that like those stories about lost pets that find their way home, Maserati has found their way home to the French. Also, side note, when the company's merged, Ferrari somehow ran away and became its own company again. The more you know. One of the big challenges in doing just about anything in America is how spread out we are. This map is from 2010, but it's good enough for the point I'm trying to make. The purple represents metropolitan areas, which is what the Census Bureau calls places with more than 50,000 people living in them. There are 381 of these in the US. On top of that, there are the green dots, which are micropolitan areas, which have 10 to 50k people in them. There are 536 of them. Add to that the white areas, which are non-metro areas where 6% of the population lives. 6% of the population of the US is pretty close to the current population of Romania. In order to cover this spread out populace, Peugeot had a grand total of 151 dealerships in 1991 when they pulled out of the market. They didn't even have half the metro areas in the US covered. Earlier in the 20th century, Americans were even more spread out with 50% of them living in rural areas, which meant that having a small number of dealerships was an even bigger issue. Because remember, a dealership is not just a car store. It's also where you're supposed to go if something is wrong with your car. One of the main jobs of a car, especially in the era 
when French cars were still being sold here was to take the family on a vacation. If you don't have any dealerships, people are not going to feel comfy driving across the country in your car. Citroen also peaked at about 170 dealerships, and you don't want to be lost in the middle of the woods in Idaho trying to figure out how to get new mineral oil testicles for your DS. If you want some perspective on just how minuscule 151 dealerships was in the scheme of things in 1991. In 1991, there were 3,000 Chevrolet dealerships in the US. Or even crazier, there were 200 Lexus dealerships by then, despite the fact that they only started selling Lexuses in the US in 1989. To Renault's credit, they actually saw that this is an issue, but they tried to fix it in the weirdest way possible. Renault bought into AMC in order to use their dealership network. Not a terrible idea on paper. In 1980, AMC had about 1,500 dealerships. Great. The issue is, by the 80s, the only reason you went to an AMC dealership was to buy an off-road vehicle. Gone was AMC's glory days of building cars like the Javelin, the Matador, and one of the coolest cars ever made, the Gremlin. In the 80s, the only reason you went to an AMC dealership was to buy a Wrangler, a Cherokee, a Wagoneer, or an Eagle, which was like a four-wheel drive station wagon, kind of like the Outback is today. So the sales strategy of somehow convincing people that came in for something that they could drive on a hunting trip, that what they actually wanted was a slow economy car, had some flaws. Another potential flaw with this plan that I saw referenced online is that I saw a couple people saying that at these AMC Renault dealerships, AMC paid better commission. I don't have hard proof on that last part though, so take it with a grain of salt. One of the main selling points of the major French car brands in Europe is their affordability. Today, here in the US, there are only three new cars you can buy for under $20,000. The Mitsubishi Mirage, the Kia Rio, and the Nissan Versa, all of which start around $18,000. Meanwhile, right now in France, there are cars like the Citroen C1 that starts at just 12,350 euros, which is about $13,400. When the French were still selling cars in the US though, they did not have this advantage. The Citroen 2CV was $1,195 when it came out in the US in 1955. This did make it one of the cheapest new cars in the US at the time, but it wasn't really a good value. There were several other car models like the Ford Custom that were only a few hundred dollars more, which adjusted for inflation would only be about $3,000 more. The issue with this is that the 2CV came with a 425cc engine that only made about 12 horsepower. On a good day, that could get you up to about 50 miles an hour. The Ford Custom, on the other hand, had a 4.8 liter V8 that made around 200 horsepower. With the distances Americans have to travel on a regular basis, the 2CV was not really practical. These other cars were able to maintain the common 65 mile an hour speed limit easily, where I'm sure the 2CV would sound like it was going to explode at that 50 mile an hour top speed. For our EU friends that don't know what I mean, let me give you an example. If I have to go see a specialist doctor, it's about 160 kilometers or 100 miles each way because of our busted ass infrastructure. The other issue was that for a little bit more money on those American cars, you could get air conditioning, which the French still are not really big on. By 1960, 20% of new cars in the US were bought with air conditioning, and that was closer to 80% in the southern half of the country. Again, for any EU friends watching that don't understand why, you can find a near endless supply of videos where local news channels bake cookies on the dash of a car whenever they need to fill time. These air conditioners at the time were even pretty good. The compressors and GM vehicles from this time period were made by Frigid Air, the fridge company who GM owned. The last major issue for the 2CV in the 50s was the fact that thousands of World War II surplus Jeeps were being sold by the government for as little as a few hundred dollars. Many Americans would be familiar with driving these Jeeps and they would become popular in farms and then in the country, which was the main market for the 2CV. Renault, on the other hand, actually bothered to make a factory in the US, but they didn't do that till 1982 when they were making the alliance with AMC. This let them sell it for about $5,500, which was pretty comparable to the Civic and the Corolla. Motor Trend also got 37 miles per gallon in their 83 alliance, which was pretty good for the time and a big deal because gas prices were high in the early 80s. It actually did pretty well at first, selling about 142k in 83 and 208k in 84. But as the 80s continued and gas prices fell, so did Alliance sales. The 86 and 87 model years sold a combined 100k units in the US. Interestingly, in Europe, the Alliance was called a Renault 9 if it was a sedan, or a Renault 11 if it was a hatchback. This is ironic because it was like 911 for Renault's chances in America. It was the last car they sold in the US with a Renault badge on it. In case you were wondering, when Renault pulled out of AMC and America in 1987, Chrysler bought out AMC and got the Jeep brand in it. They also sold a few rebadged Renaults till they decided it wasn't worth it. Part of the reason Renault gave up on America at that specific time was because their CEO was assassinated. This was possibly due to some unpopular moves he made to make Renault profitable, including closing plants and investing more in the American side. The murders were blamed on a group called Action Direct, who were libertarian communists. I'm gonna be honest with you. Till I wrote this script, I did not know those were terms that could go together. It's almost like being a ladies man shown in protagonist. His successors were not as interested in trying to grow their market in the US. The more luxury oriented models also had a very hard time competing with Lincoln and Cadillac here in the US. 
Also looking through old car reviews of things like the Peugeot 604, I saw it mostly compared to the Mercedes 300D, complaining that the Peugeot had worse gas mileage. The lack of brand recognition in the US and the French being known for affordable cars meant that it did not have the prestige of the Germans or Jaguar for what people wanted in a foreign-made luxury car. We could do more examples, but that would bog down the video. Overall, the French tended to have a hard time competing on price and features, with their most successful cars being things like the Renault Dauphine and the Citroën DS. These mostly won over people with their styling. The more basic-looking cars just didn't have a chance to stand out. Also, in general, very budget-oriented cars tend to struggle in the US due to a robust used car market. A lot of people in the older generation in the US would buy a beater for a few hundred dollars and run it till it needed to repair their cost too much, then sell it for scrap and buy another junker. Peugeot ended up pulling out of the US in 1991 due to these pricing issues. They even tried a plan where they sold Peugeot 505s with a sweetheart deal to New York taxi drivers. It's kind of an advertising scheme. The issue was that the New York cabbies were slow to pick them up because they were still about five grand more than a Chevy Caprice or a Ford Crown Victoria. On top of that, the suspension had issues with New York roads and the parts had to be shipped from France, creating a wait time. So it may have been one of the worst PR stunts in automotive history. If you are in America and desperately want your commute to feel like you are inside Gerard Depardieu, I do have good news. Renault is supposedly planning a comeback to the US as early as 2027. This time, they may be selling out of Nissan dealerships due to them being part of the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi Alliance. This makes it so that the three companies have shared technology and resources and possibly dealerships in the future. The Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi Alliance also makes it annoying to look up info of the car known as the Renault Alliance. Although there have been rumors that Peugeot and Citroen might come back to the US due to the Stellantis merger, they have been adamant in denying it recently. I do have a theory that we will be getting some of their cars as Chryslers though. The Chrysler 300 is in process of ending production, meaning that soon the only vehicle they will be selling will be the Pacifica. I feel like there's a good chance that they will fill out their lineup with some Citroens and Peugeots. It could just be a new badge, or maybe a Dodge engine that helps parts availability, but it seems silly to keep a whole brand alive to sell one minivan and its hybrid version. That's all I got for you. Have a good day, and eat something good.